M S W Media. Thank you, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, for sponsoring this episode. Go to HelloFresh.com slash DailyBeans16 and use code DailyBeans16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Wednesday, June 28th, 2023. Today, the audio tape of Donald Trump showing a classified document to staffers has leaked. Special counsel Jack Smith's prosecutors will meet with Brad Raffensperger in Atlanta today. The Supreme Court rules against the independent state legislature theory. The reason Walt Nauta wasn't arraigned today and the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act goes into effect nationwide. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Bad, sick people. That, but, was, that was your coup, you know, against you. That's well, it the, started right at the like beginning. Like when Millie's talking about, oh, you were going to try to do a coup. No, they, they were trying right. to do that before you even were sworn in. That's right. No, trying yeah. to overthrow yeah. your election. Well, with Millie, uh, let me see that. I'll, I'll show you an example. He said that I wanted to attack Iran. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. Look. This was him. They presented me this. This is off the record, but they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. Wow. We looked at some. This was him. This wasn't done by me. This was him. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. It's pages long. Look. Mm. Wait a minute. Let's see here. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. I just found, isn't that amazing? This totally wins my case, you know. Mm-hmm. Except it is like highly confidential, yeah. <laughs> secret. This is secret information. But look, look at this. You attack, and Hillary would print that out all the time. You know, <laughs> send it, email. No, she'd send it to yeah. Anthony Weiner, yeah, yeah. the pervert. Um, by the way, isn't that incredible? Though? Yeah. I was just saying because we were talking about it, <laughs> and you know, he said he wanted to attack Iran and what. And These are the papers. Wow. This was done by the military, given to me. Uh, I think we can probably. Right? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to figure out. A, a, yeah. See, as president, I could have declassified yeah. it. Now I can't, you know, but this is yeah, classified. Now we have a problem. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's so cool. I mean, it's so. I'm, look, we here and I have a. And you probably almost didn't believe me, but now you believe me. No, I believe you. It's incredible, right? No. Hey, bring some uh, some cokes in, please. So I was watching, Dana, I was watching, uh, first of all, happy, happy Wednesday. Oh, to you as well, of course. Um, I was watching Bradley Moss on MSNBC, and, and, and the thing that struck him the most about this tape was all the laughing and isn't this cool and like the cavalierness of it. And a couple of things struck me, too, specifically the the fact that he has somebody hand him the document. I'm wondering yep. who that is. And then at the end, he asks for some Cokes. Go get us some Cokes. And I'm wondering if he's talking to Walt Nauta. Oh, my God. He might be, because wasn't he his Diet Coke <laughs> Sherpa? He, he was the Diet Coke valet, right? So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, but yeah, but, I, you know, again, it's just the absolute cavalierness of it. And we've read... The transcript of this audio recording, we read it in the indictment, but hearing it just lands different. It does. And also the, the, the staffer, I mean, just stroking. So I have to wonder, obviously, who recorded this and who leaked it, first of all, but the staffer, the, the fucking ego stroking and the disgusting, like, uh, I don't even know how to explain oh, it. Oh, like this was the coup on you. This oh, was the- oh, yeah. Just all of that. But I do have to wonder if this person knows him so well that all of this was going to get him to talk. Like, it, I don't know. It just someone felt like they were prodding him to say things that they knew they were recording. And he did. He did. I don't know. I do not know, but uh, I believe that this was the one where the uh, couple of Meadows writers uh, were in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, Mindy and another lawyer. So, you know, we'll find out a lot more, I think, as, as the trial approaches, which could be next year. DOJ wants it this December. 
And uh, as predicted on the Jack podcast, special counsel is homing in on the fraudulent elector scheme and the big fraud, right? Raising money off of the big lie. And uh, Dossie and Barrett, who put out a big giant Washington Post article, decided to put in the last paragraph and it's updated now. So it's the third to last paragraph now. But they buried the lead that Raffensperger is going to be interviewing with Jack Smith's folks, his prosecutors and investigators in Atlanta today. And, you know, I wrote a whole piece on post.news about why I think it took so long to get to the Raffensperger interview. And of course, I'll, I'll discuss all that with Andy McCabe on this weekend's episode of the Jackpot. But they're going to interview uh, Raffensperger. So that and, and that to me signals uh, we're at the tippy top, the very end of this investigation. So we'll uh, we'll go over all that information. But we do have a lot of other news to get to today. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. From Lawrence Hurley at NBC, the Supreme Court on Tuesday saved democracy. Well, actually prevented it from collapsing. Uh, They declined to impose new limits on state courts reviewing certain election related issues by ruling against Republicans in North Carolina fighting for a congressional district map that would heavily favor their candidates. The justices ruled in a 6-3 vote that the North Carolina Supreme Court was acting within its authority and concluding that the map constituted a partisan gerrymander under the Constitution. In doing so, the court declined to embrace a broad vision of a hitherto obscure legal argument called the independent state legislature theory, which Republicans say limits the authority of state courts to strike down certain election laws enacted by state legislatures. Supporters of the former guy cited the theory in various cases during the 2020 presidential election and its aftermath, all those things they lost. The ruling was widely welcomed by voting rights groups and Democrats who'd been worried about the implications of a ruling that could curb state power in a 2024 election and beyond. Quote, today, the Supreme Court rejected the fringe independent state legislature theory that threatened to upend our democracy and dismantle our systems of checks and balances. That's what Barack Obama tweeted today. The independent state legislature hinges on language in the election clause of the Constitution that says election rules shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Supporters of the theory, which had never been endorsed by the Supreme Court, say the language supports the notion that when it comes to federal election rules, legislatures in the states have the ultimate power under state law, potentially irrespective of potential constraints imposed by state constitutions. Quote, state courts retain the authority to apply state constitutional restraints when legislatures act on the power conferred on them by the elections clause. That's what Chief Justice Roberts wrote in the majority opinion. He added, though, that state courts do not have free reign when there are conflicts with the federal law. In those situations, federal courts can intervene. Quote, in interpreting state law in this area, state courts may not so exceed the bounds of ordinary judicial review as to unconstitutionally intrude upon the role specifically reserved to state legislatures. Again, that's Roberts. After the then Democratic controlled state Supreme Court in North Carolina issued the ruling last year, the court flipped to Republican control following November's midterm elections and recently overturned the decision, a move that prompted questions about whether the justices even needed to decide the case. In the dissent, one of them, Clarence Thomas, joined by fellow conservatives Samuel Alito and Gorsuch, said the case was moot as a result. Thomas complained that the decision will lead to further confusion in lower courts that could give rise to more cases like the Supreme Court's Bush v. Gore ruling issued in 2000, which ultimately led to George W. Bush taking office as president. The court, Thomas said, opens a new field for Bush-style controversies over state election law and far more uncertain one. Conservative Justice Brett Kavanaugh made it clear in a separate opinion that the court is likely to visit the scope of state court authority in a later case. In Tuesday's ruling, the court recognized and articulated a general principle for federal court review of state court decisions in federal election cases. So let me basically break this down for you. Republicans wanted to be able to put forward state slates of electors for somebody who the people didn't vote for, which is what Trump wanted done in 2020 when he disrupted the peaceful transfer of power and schemed with the fraudulent electors to hand over fake slates uh, of electors to declare Trump the victor. And uh, the the Supreme Court said no today. That's dumb. Uh, And I'm very glad that they did. But they reserve the right to do stupid shenanigans like they did with Bush v. Gore. So it's very, very good that they said no to the independent state legislature theory. But 
they still reserve the right to be assholes in the future. Well, I think what's interesting, and um, the three people that dissented, obviously, I, I th- find it interesting and not coincidental that they're the three that are under scrutiny, by the way, for the things that are not, they're not reporting on their taxes from these like mega donors that want to influence elections. Now, I know that I'm speaking out of my ass. It's just a conspiracy theory, but like Kavanaugh and and, and Barrett, they were put on the court for one specific reason, in my opinion, and that was to overturn Roe. And they did. But I think it's really interesting that the three that dissented are the ones that are in hot water with mega donors and not actually claiming that that the gifts on their on their taxes. It's just I think it's interesting. Yeah, interesting, but also true. We should say that Thomas's dissent says that the case should have been moot anyway. Right. But that's also a weird dissent. And you should just have voted with the majority if you, you know, anyway. (laughs) I don't know. I just think it's really interesting. But it is. Yeah. Again, again, every once in a while, I'm a conspiracy theorist. In at heart. Now, this is from Hugo Lowell at The Guardian. Donald Trump's valet charged in the classified documents case has his arraignment on Tuesday delayed for a second time to July by a magistrate judge after he was forced to abandon his top choice Florida lawyer over a dispute about legal fees. That's according to two people familiar with the matter. The valet, Walt Nada, he appeared alongside Trump when the former president pleaded not guilty to 37 criminal charges in federal district court Miami this month, but he could not himself enter a plea which is a necessary step to start a trial preparation because he didn't have local counsel. Well, two weeks later, Nada still does not have local counsel, admitted to practice in the Southern District of Florida after the person at the top of the shortlist drawn up by Nada's defense team decided he needed to charge higher fees to represent him the night before the arraignment. (laughs) Sounds like a fine upstanding guy. The previously unreported dispute over fees and effect meant Nada could not retain the person as his Florida lawyer. That's what the people said, even though he would be paid by Trump's political action committee, Save America, which has also been paying the fees of his lead lawyer, Stanley Woodward. All these suckers out there, you are paying for the legal fees and not for his campaign. The reason for the rate hike was not clear, but at least one Florida lawyer who has seriously considered representing Nada decided several days ago that the reputational and legal risks of working with Trump's co-defendant in the documents case were too great. Sorry, but your friend's a dick and we're not going down for this. (laughs) Yep, the last minute scramble to find a trial lawyer has been a common theme in the classified documents case after Trump struggled to find local counsel for his arraignment and ultimately used an existing lawyer admitted to the Southern District of Florida who also sponsored in a New York-based lawyer. (laughs) All right? But, It has been made more difficult because not his team has been seeking defense lawyers who have not previously worked as prosecutors. And anyone Nada retains would also need the blessing of Donald and his own defense team, who see no need to make a decision quickly. Mm. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to fall for this, and maybe they think it's going to be him. In fact, the people said Trump's preference has been for delay, a strategy that has come about from the belief that if the trial can be pushed back to after 2024's election— and he should win. <gasps> Trump is the front runner for the Republican nomination, as we know, and he thinks that case would be moot if he won. At the brief 10 minute hearing, the chief magistrate judge for the court, Edwin Torres, rescheduled not his arraignment for July 6th after Woodward said his client had been unable to find local counsel, and that he was unable to attend in court because of flight cancellations. In recognition of the fact that Nada's new arraignment could delay the criminal case, Prosecutors asked the magistrate judge to set a new hearing date before the 14th of July, when all parties are due before U.S. District Court Judge Aileen Cannon to set a timetable to start the discovery process. The move by Torres to delay the arraignment for a second time was unusual, given magistrate judges have the authority to assign a federal public defender or a standby counsel to represent defendants on a one-off basis so that they can enter a plea. Well, Nada was also not required to attend the arraignment in person which raised questions about the relevance of the cancellations. Privately, the people said, Woodward had wanted Nada to meet the prospective lawyers the day before, but that explanation did not address the fee dispute. It's just a mess. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have to be there. He could have dialed it in on Zoom, but he didn't. And so there was no arraignment because he wasn't there, even though they could have given him a lawyer right then and there. So these are just delay tactics, in my opinion. All right, next up from Ryan's Nobles and Riley at NBC. 
Federal law enforcement agencies failed to correctly analyze a wide range of intelligence showing the potential for violence on January 6th. That's according to Democrats on the Senate Homeland Security Committee in their report released Tuesday. The report, written by the committee's chair, Senator Gary Peters, a Democrat of Michigan, and staff, provides specific examples of threats of violence and plans for the attack on the Capitol that were collected by agencies in the lead up to January 6th, including the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, the INA. The report concludes that the agencies consistently downplayed the potential for violence. And as a result, the government did not prepare the proper security apparatus for Washington that day. Quote, at a fundamental level, the agencies failed to fulfill their mission and connect the public and non-public information they received. That's what the report read. And they have emails and documents that demonstrate the breadth and gravity of the threats these agencies received related to January 6th. As an example, on January 2nd, Four days before the riot, the social media platform Parler sent a post from a user on its site to the FBI that read, this is not a rally and it's no longer a protest. This is a final stand where we are drawing the red line at Capitol Hill. Don't be surprised if we take the Capitol building. That post was one of many alluding to the potential for violence leading up to January 6th. But the report found that despite such violent online rhetoric, the FBI and the INA continued to downplay the threat and instead advised the U.S. Capitol Police and the Washington Metro Police to prepare for a normal political rally. Quote, what was shocking is that the attack was essentially planned in plain sight on social media, Peter said in an interview, and yet it seems as if our intelligence agencies completely dropped the ball. And here we go. An internal email from the FBI's Washington field office cited in the report outlined a collection of online threats, including a long list of videos, social media posts, and message board activity detailing plans for an attack on Washington. But the email ultimately concluded that the threats were isolated and not evidence of a serious problem. Quote, FBI WFO, that's the Washington field office, does not have any information to suggest these events will involve anything other than First Amendment protected activity. Adding, the FBI had identified no credible or verified threat to the activities associated with January 6, 2021. And not in this piece, Dana, but I want to add, mm-hmm. guess who was heading up the WFO, the Washington field office of the FBI at that time? Please to tell me. It was Dan Tuono. That's the same guy, Jim Jordan's pal, same guy ah. who refused to allow the DOJ to get subpoenas and search warrants for Mar-a-Lago, Stuart Rhodes, John Eastman, Jeffrey Clark, Scott Perry. It's why everybody's blaming the DOJ for starting the January 6th investigation late now. It's because of this fucking guy and Mike fucking Sherwin. This fucking guy. Someone needs to investigate Dan Tuono. I agree. The fact that Jim Jordan brought him up by name multiple times during the Durham testimony last week just sent my red flags a fly in. And, uh, you know, if you read that Washington Post article about the delay in opening the January 6th investigation of the DOJ. If you read it carefully, you will notice that every single thwart came from Dan Tuono, the FBI, and Mike Sherwin. These are all Trump holdovers. Yeah. And so I just want everybody to just be clear when you read these things to to pay attention to those kinds of details. But fuck this guy. We don't have any credible information about credible threats associated with January. There's no activities and threats with January 6th. That guy. That yep. guy. All those dots connect, and they do. All right, last in this segment, this is from Julianne McShane at NBC. And this is a great story. Millions of pregnant and postpartum workers across the country would be legally entitled to longer breaks, shorter hours, and time off for medical appointments and recovery from childbirth beginning Tuesday when the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act takes effect. Woo-hoo! Yep, the new law mandates that employers with at least 15 employees provide, and I quote, reasonable accommodations to workers who need them due to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. That's according to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is tasked with enforcing this law. An estimated 2.8 million workers annually could benefit from the policy change. That's according to a report published last fall by the advocacy organization National Partnership for Women and Families. The EEOC has yet to publish a list of the types of accommodations that will be required under the law. But examples could include more flexible hours, the option to sit in jobs that require long periods of standing, a parking spot closer to the workplace, access to uniforms and safety apparel that fit a pregnant person's changing body. How beautiful is that? And excusal from heavy lifting or working around chemicals that could be dangerous during pregnancy. That's according to the EEOC. The fact that none of this is law already is fucking mind blowing, by the way. I know, right? 
Yep. By the end of this year, the commission is required to publish guidance on how employers should implement the law, including a list of examples of reasonable accommodations, which the public will have a chance to weigh in on. Dina Baxt, co-founder and co-president of Workers' Rights Advocacy Organization, which is a better balance, that's what it's called, a better balance, pushed for the law over the past decade. She said she expects the change will particularly benefit pregnant workers in low-wage and male-dominated jobs, since such employees often fear losing their jobs if they ask for pregnancy-related accommodations. For example, Bax added, mandating bathroom access, let's say, and water breaks sounds so basic, but for women in retail and other low-wage industries with overly rigid, inflexible jobs, these kind of accommodations can make a big difference. Now, A Better Balance has operated a free legal helpline since 2009, and Bax said, many pregnant workers who have called in the past reporting facing devastating economic consequences, including food insecurity and homelessness, because they were fired or forced out of work after requesting just pregnancy-related accommodations. Well, Biden signed the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act into law in December. That was following a years-long push to bring it to a vote in the Senate. Earlier versions of the bill passed in the House with bipartisan support in 2019 and 2021, and shockingly, of course, but it didn't pass the Senate until it became part of the $1.7 trillion government funding bill. Thank you, President Biden. Indeed. All right, everybody, we have a lot of good news. You send it in and we read it. You can send it to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. But we have to take a quick break before that. We'll be right back. Stick around. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. HelloFresh and their meal kits have kickstarted my kitchen revolution. No more fretting over ingredients or recipes. It's like having a culinary expert by my side guiding me to create delicious meals with ease and flair. Are you stuck in a recipe rut? Take a bite out of something new with 40 recipes to choose from weekly. Go to HelloFresh.com slash DailyBeans16 and use code DailyBeans16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. The summer, don't let the question be what's for dinner. I, I, am, I am guilty of that. What's for dinner? What's for dinner? Don't let it loom over your fun activities. HelloFresh has the solution. They have pre-measured high quality ingredients, easy recipes that will simplify your cooking process. And with HelloFresh, you get mouth-watering, chef-designed recipes delivered right to your doorstep, saving you extra time to enjoy your summer. HelloFresh is more than just a meal kit. It's a catalyst to unleash your culinary prowess, which I never had before until HelloFresh. Their fail-safe instructions and top-notch proteins and veggies make it easy to master delicious and easy-to-cook dishes. There's something for everyone at the HelloFresh menu. Crave pescatarian or vegetarian? They've got you covered. You can even tailor the recipes by switching proteins and sides to your liking. And if you're in a rush, HelloFresh's quick and easy menu options, including their fast and fresh meals, are perfect for you. I love these. They can be cooked and ready in 15 minutes or less. Lately, I've been infatuated with their mushroom flatbreads. They're so good. This Hall of Fame recipe, rich medley of earthly mushrooms atop a perfectly crisp flatbread. It's an all-star dish I find myself falling in love with over and over again. And I love to try new recipes every week, and I've enjoyed every single one. So go to HelloFresh.com slash DailyBeans16. And use code DAILYBEANS16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. You'll be glad you did. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Good news, everyone. Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, if you want to play what the mutt or what the heck wine or send pictures of frog orgies or baby pictures, uh, or let's say if you don't have a pod pet, you can send an adoptable pet in your area or give a shout out to someone you love or a shout out to a local business that you want to support or your own business. Anything at all you want to send to us, you can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. A heads up for listeners on Stitcher. Stitcher is discontinuing the Stitcher app. Starting August 29th, the Stitcher app will not be doing its thing anymore. It's going away, I guess. Uh, It'll be uh, what you call a dead app. It will will shuffle off this mortal coil. It will have expired. (laughs) It will be an ex-podcast app. (laughs) Please find a replacement app to get your beans. First up, from Jessica, pronouns she and her. Hello, you beautiful beans. My mom has been telling me to listen to you two forever. And then the writer's strike took away my regularly scheduled shows. When the last guy started making legal news, I needed people who were smarter than me to explain what it all means. Bonus points, since you always make me laugh. And even though the news sometimes feels doom and gloom, AG and DG, Jack, and all your guests give me hope. 
I can't imagine starting my day without you. Thank you, Jessica. I finished my last binge and started looking for my next background show when I rediscovered an old favorite of mine that I'm watching in a bit of a different light. Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries first episode revolves around doctors giving botched back alley abortions. Jesus. Apparently, Amazon Prime is also pulling this one episode in a few days, but not the others, which is a little sus in my opinion, but I digress. Thanks for doing all you do. I'm attaching photos of my Dorcas dog, Dargo. My mom sent in some photos while I was in the Peace Corps, and now he's had his DNA tested, so we can play What the Mutt. Oh. What do you think? Pity? Yeah. Roddy? Yeah. Mm, Chow? Why not? Pity? Roddy? Chow? Staffy? Lab? That's all I got. German Shepherd? Look at those ears. Those are pity ears, though. Oh, well, let's see. Let's see what we got. We got Australian Shepherd, Roddy, Roddy, Staffy, okay, and American Bully. All right, so we got two. Okay, well, <laughs> Amer- just p- what's an American Bully? <laughs> <laughs> Bulldog, I think. I mean, that sounds like a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Joe Rogan. <laughs> That's right. He's just an American Bully. One hundred percent. We had we we had Joe Rogan's uh, DNA t- tested, and he's one hundred percent American Bully. <laughs> Oh, this might just be funny to us. Okay, this is for Amber, pronoun she and her. Hello, Beans Queens. I have a pet tax. We adopted our six-year-old pit mix 11 weeks ago for my seven-year-old's birthday. Aww. My kiddos have been wanting a dog. It's, it's been two years since our mini dachshund had passed. Our pit, Rex, is the best. He's so sweet and snuggly and our perfect fit. And he has bunny ears that are always standing straight up. Here's our Rex Roover. Yes, like Lex Luthor. Isn't he the best? I mean, oh he really is the best. Look at... Uh, loving the belly rubs. Look at these beautiful children. I love the bunny ears. So good. Thank you. Thank you so much for that submission. Next up from Anonymous Pronouns, she and her. The debate today about the pronunciation of Wagner versus Wagner reminded me of the time I shut down an old boss who was a bully. I was engaged to my now husband, 22 years and counting. Congratulations. The delightful Mr. Wagner, pronounced with a W, who is very proud of his German heritage. His mother came to the U.S. from Germany in her early 20s, and he still has lots of family there. One day, my boss asked me why I insist on pronouncing my future surname Wagner. Your fiance is German, right? He should pronounce it Wagner. That sounds more German. It's a stronger name. Wagner sounds so Jewish. Wow. I replied with 100% honesty and looking him dead in the eyes. His father is Jewish. Have you ever experienced the pure joy of knocking a bully off their game with (laughs) just a few words? I'll never forget how good it felt to see the look on that boss's face when he realized what an ass he just proved himself to be. Thank you for letting me share. The Wagner name has been getting a bad rap lately with all the horrible reputation of the Wagner group. However you choose to pronounce it. Oh, that's such a good one. That's one of those things like I'm never good at that in the moment. I always think of it in like when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, having the argument over and over again in my head. Mm-hmm. I'll eventually win it, but it takes a few weeks. That yep. is. Yeah. But you had it right there and you fucking delivered that line. So cool. Well done. Well done. Okay, this is from Jennifer, pronouns she and her. My good news includes a couple things. My girl child has just graduated from college. She had a pre-planned trip to Europe in June, but in the meantime, she was interviewing for a job in her field, environmental science. While she was at the airport waiting for her flight, she received an offer letter from a big company that she really wanted to join. So before she jetted off to Paris and Amsterdam, she signed the offer letter and will return home to the perfect job. So cool. That sounds fucking great. This community is so wonderful and is so wonderful in their submissions. Funny, happy, uplifting, and always thoughtful. So thank you to everyone that listens and contributes. My pet tax includes Marley, my boy cat, that seems to enjoy sitting on my open laptop. I know others have had this experience, so maybe we can see pics of cats sitting on laptops. Love you, AG and DG, and everyone that contributes to this show. I thank each and every one of you. That is a man cat face, and he is yeah. definitely a laptop Yeah, Marley sitter. actually owns that laptop now. I don't know if you know that, but... Yeah, and, and here's something, Jennifer. I have a decoy laptop that uh, always sits upon my desk. It's, a, it's an older laptop that I plug in and open up and it keeps warm so that my cats can specifically just lay on that one so I can continue working on the one I need to work on. Yes. And if you want to send in photos of cats on your electronics, 
staying warm, please, please do. And how cool to come home to your dream job. I just like to come home to a clean house, but right before you were about to go on a dream vacation. I mean, you done, you did something right in this world. That's for sure. Heck yeah. All right. From Meredith, pronouns she and her. Hey there. Not sure how to categorize my news, but I'll call it good. Last Sunday, I attended the Cure concert in Columbia, Maryland. Ah, During one of the slower songs, the people in the rows in front of me sat down. I was standing there enjoying my unobstructed view of the stage and the music when I swear Robert Smith looked out into the audience and locked eyes. Could have been my imagination, but I like to think he noticed my crimes and crimes and crimes MSW t-shirt that I had on. Here is my silly bull mastiff for pod pet tax and a photo of the show. The Cure is my favorite band. And I feel like my like my life has come full circle that you wore a crimes and crimes and crimes shirt to go see The Cure. I wasn't able to get tickets this this time. I might go try to see them in Europe, but man, what a great concert they've been putting on. And look at this doggo. I know. So cute. I love The Cure. They have some of the best songs. They're my favorite. They're my favorite. Yeah. They are Since indeed. I was a kid, I remember, uh, oh, I was so pissed. I went to Catholic school, uh, high school for a, f- a few years. And uh, on Fridays, you could pay a dollar to wear jeans or shorts, huh. right? And a t-shirt. Like, and so you didn't have to wear your Catholic schoolgirl uniform. And so we always took advantage of that. And one Friday, I wore jeans and my, the prayer tour shirt, when Disintegration came out, it was called the prayer tour. And the nuns made me turn it inside out or put black tape on it because they said it was sacrilegious. Cut to fucking four months later when we're trying to come up with a prom theme. You know what the fucking nuns pick? Fascination Street. Stop it. Fassa fucking nations. A song about fellatio (laughs) that was played on the prayer tour. (laughs) Now, of course, I didn't object because I was like, sweet. Right. Cool. School doing disintegration type stuff. But motherfuckers. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Oh, Sister Joni Knuckles. She was interesting. Anyway. (laughs) That's what we called her. (laughs) Yeah, Knuckles. Anyhow, uh, please send us your your good news stories. Anything you want to say. If you've been to a concert recently, it's summertime. Send us that. Send it. Did you go to Glastonbury? Did you... You going to go see... uh, Smash Mouth at the uh, at the fair. My my friend is the lead singer, the new lead singer of Smash Mouth. So just giving him a plug. Nice. I'm actually headed to uh, another Indigo Girls concert next week. I'm oh. super excited. I'm going to go see them again in Boulder, Colorado. Awesome. Friend of the yeah. pod, Ben Folds is on tour. Go see him at one of the nice. best concerts you'll ever see. Bear Nakeds, the Bear Naked Ladies are on tour. They might be giants are out there. Go, go see oh. a show. After that, I'm going to go see Pink and Brandy Carlisle in New oh. York. I hate you. I'm so excited. You don't understand. She's like, wait, she's like, like, yeah, she's, <sighs> she's it. She's it. My aunt that blow me one last kiss. That was like my divorce anthem. Oh, like, so good. Uh, love that. It's a good running yeah. song too. 167 beats per minute. It's a perfect running song. They're okay. Perfect. <laughs> All right, everybody. That has been the show. We will be back in your ears tomorrow. Do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here, Dana? No, I think I got them all out during the discussion. We decided to throw in at the end of the podcast. (laughs) Awesome. Everybody, we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And please take someone with you. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for the Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. Hey, it's Liz and Moji, host of the Feminist Buzzkills podcast, and we have a special episode you don't want to miss. June 24th marks one year after the end of Roe, and we're looking back with an abortion provider and an activist who've been navigating the fallout. Amy Hegstra Miller, founder and CEO of Whole Women's Health, explains the realities of scrambling to close clinics while opening in safe states and shares the emotional strain that takes on patients and staff. Executive Director of Amplified Georgia Collaborative, Allison Kaufman, lays out the importance of coalition building to restore and expand access to abortion. 
Plus, comedian and dope queen Phoebe Robinson rounds it out with some radical self-care tips and why she crowned Pedro Pascal this year's King of Peen. This special episode drops June 23rd wherever you get your podcasts. Shit's not awesome, but we got facts, actions, and jokes. The Feminist Buzzkills Pod. When BS is popping, we pop off. Hi, I'm Harry Littman, host of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Fed's favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond. Plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts.